Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to what is the first of hopefully many system design breakdowns. Uh, today we're going to be walking through a common system design interview question that's asked at many of the top companies. So we're going to be designing a ticket booking service like Ticketmaster. So this question is asked a lot at Meta in particular, especially in what they call their product design interview, though it's also asked uh, quite a bit in the regular system design interview. Now, I spent five years at Meta. Uh, I was an interviewer and a staff engineer there. And I'm now the co-founder of Hello Interview, which is a site that helps candidates prepare for upcoming interviews largely by a mocks with senior FANG engineers and managers. Uh, so between asking this question at Meta and asking it in mocks by Hello Interview, I've probably asked it uh, probably well over 50 times. And I've seen exactly where candidates of all levels do well and where they trip up. So today we'll walk through this problem in the same structure as if it was a real interview, uh, but I'll periodically be interjecting with tips, frameworks, et cetera, kind of lessons learned from those many mocks that, uh, that I've done across both Meta and Hello Interview. Lastly, before we get started, um, if videos aren't your thing, I've also written up a, a detailed kind of breakdown of this question on Hello Interview. So you can head over there and read this. I'll, I'll link it below. You can see there's also a number of other uh, breakdowns of common questions that you can check out as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, before we jump immediately into designing the system, let's talk about the suggested roadmap. And this is the roadmap I suggest that you follow for any of your system design interviews, particularly those that are um, designing these user-facing products like Design Ticketmaster is. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the requirements. This includes the functional requirements, kind of the features of the system, as well as the non-functional requirements, so the qualities of the system. And then we'll outline our core entities. This is like, what is the data that's persisted and exchanged throughout our system? We'll go over the APIs, and then we'll do a high-level design, which satisfies our functional requirements, so a simple design that satisfies the main features of the system. And then we'll conclude with deep dives. And these deep dives, uh, will be a conversation with the interviewer, depending on your level, the interviewer might even lead this, um, but it's going to go deeper into satisfying those non-functional requirements, mainly. So this is the plan that, that we're going to follow, uh, and we'll go section by section. The first thing that we'll do is we'll jump right into the requirements. So when your interview starts, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to start by writing down your functional requirements. These are the features of the system, and they're usually statements like users should be able to. So when you get here, hopefully you've had some experience with this system in the past. Usually they choose really popular systems. If you haven't, ask the interviewer a lot about the system. What does it do? What's most important functionality? What are its features? How do users use it, etc. Once you have that good sense, then start to list what are the core features. The core meaning the ones that are most necessary to make this uh, system work and function. So in the case of Design Ticketmaster, the very first most important one is users should be able to book tickets. So we'll add book tickets there, the shorthand of that. Uh, in order to book a ticket, a user needs to be able to view an event. So you can imagine viewing an event page, seeing a seat map, choosing a seat. We'll call this viewing an event. So view an event, view the event details, who's performing, etc. And then you can ask yourself, well, how do they get to, we're sort of walking backwards through the user flow. How do they get to viewing an event in the first place? Well, they need some discovery. They need some search. So users should be able to search for events. And so in my estimation, these are the main top three functional requirements. Users can search for an event. They'll see a drop down list of events. They'll click on one of them. This will take them to an event page. From here, they can book a ticket to that event. Perfect. Uh, these are usually the functional requirements that most candidates end up landing on and the functional requirements that I sort of like uh, push them towards if they're asking questions or need any help. Once you've done your functional requirements, you're going to do your non-functional requirements. And so your non-functional requirements are the qualities of the system. They're not features, uh, but they're the qualities of the system like scalability, availability, reliability, fault tolerance, all these things that I'm sure you've read a number of times uh, in the books and the resources. The biggest mistake that candidates make here, though, is that they just write those terms. They just write availability and scalability and, and whatever it may be, all of these illities. Um, this is not always strictly wrong, but it's defeating the purpose. Like all systems have those qualities. 
The important part of non-functional requirements is to identify what makes this system unique, interesting, and challenging. And so you should go through those illities in the context specifically of this problem. And we can do that here now. So the first question I usually ask myself is CAP theorem. In the context of CAP theorem, is my system going to prioritize availability or is it going to prioritize consistency? And kind of the easy right answer here, particularly for a mid-level candidate, is that we're going to prioritize consistency more than availability. And the reason for this is because we need to make sure that no ticket is assigned to more than one user. We can call this no double booking. Sheesh, typing is bad. No double booking, right? So for any given ticket, we can only have one user sitting in that seat. So consistency is really important for us there. Um, however, a, a more nuanced candidate, maybe a senior level candidate, would actually realize that these two things can coexist, and I'm being very careful when I say that, they can coexist, uh, but in different parts of your system, in different parts of your microservice, in different parts of your system architecture. So what I would amend this to is that we need strong consistency for booking tickets, but at the same time, uh, we want high availability for search and viewing events. That's kind of the right, more senior answer there. So when users are searching and they're viewing events, they should be highly available. And it doesn't really matter if an event was just added and they don't immediately see it within a couple of seconds, fine. But in the case of booking a ticket, if a user in Germany bought a ticket that I'm viewing while I'm here in America, um, I need to know instantly uh, that they booked that ticket or get an error because I can't book that ticket anymore, right? So strong consistency for booking tickets, high availability for searching and doing events. Um, what else is interesting in this system? Well, we can ask ourselves first about the read-write ratio. Is there anything unique there? And in this case, we would recognize that reads are much greater than writes. This is probably like 100 to 1, uh, maybe even 1,000 to 1, probably 100 to 1 if our conversion rate for booking tickets is maybe around 1%. So there's going to be a lot more people searching and viewing events than there are ultimately buying. And this is going to have consequences on our design that we'll see later on. The next is like, think about how our site is used. What's our query access pattern is often how I refer to it. So uh, what are, what's the frequency, consistency, irregularity with which requests are hitting our system? And what you would note is that people don't book tickets to events all that much. It's kind of this regular, even consistency uh, until you end up having really popular events. And so when Taylor Swift's tour is about to go live or the Super Bowl or the World Cup, all of a sudden you have tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of people at your front door trying to get the same ticket. So in the context of scaling, this is an example where you wouldn't just write scalability, but instead scalability is important, uh, but it's to handle surges from popular events specifically. And so we'll need to design with that in mind. Scalability, cool. Awesome. Um, so there's, there's a long list that you can keep going down these non-functional requirements. Um, obviously it's important that we don't use, lose data, that we remain compliant with GDPR, all of these sorts of things. But if all of that comes to mind, what I usually suggest is that you just note that as below the line. So like out of scope, uh, you know, GDPR, oops. GDPR compliance, I'm not gonna write all of these out, but fight to fault tolerance, et cetera, you sort of get it. And then once you've done this, you can say to the interviewer, uh, these are what I'm gonna prioritize. Here's what I've considered out of scope. Would you like me to reprioritize any of this? Is there anything from down here you'd like me to move up here? Anything from down here you'd like me to move down? It's sort of a nice elegant way to make sure that you check in, you're on the same page with the interviewer, and it shows them that you have this larger product thinking, that you can think about all of these things that are necessary in designing a system, um, but that you also can remain focused on, on what really matters for this particular system. Sweet. So with that, you've defined the functional and the non-functional requirements. So the next step is for us to define our core entities and the API. I'll do these sort of in the same step here because they usually come hand in hand. Usually you won't spend more than like two minutes here on core entities and, and up to five on API. Um, but the purpose of the core entities is to start to get an understanding of what data is persisted in your system and then exchanged by the APIs. So this is really going to be useful um, in order to, you're gonna use these in order to build your APIs as well as of course your high level design. So 
you can think here, what are the core entities of a system like Ticketmaster? Well, the first thing is we're going to have an event. And so admins are going to add these events. Uh, note that adding events is going to be out of scope. We're going to be focused just on sort of like the user flow for our system. Um, but users can add events. Events themselves need to be hosted somewhere. So they're usually hosted at a venue, like a stadium. Uh, and then there's somebody who's performing. So there's a performer. So we'll probably have tables for each of these or collections for each of these. And then maybe most importantly, you need a ticket. So we're gonna have a ticket table, and this is going to have all of the tickets for a given event so that we can determine whether or not they're available, who's purchased them, if they've been purchased, their price, stuff like that. So these are our core entities. Um, now, one thing that you can do is that, you know, next to these, you can mark down what all of their fields would be, name, description, etc. if you know them at this point. I usually suggest, and for me, if I was going and doing an interview right now, I would just stick to the core entities and I would be clear to my interviewer, like, I'm not going to detail the key fields and columns yet because the reality is I don't, I don't quite know them yet. I'm too early in my design. They're going to evolve naturally. So instead, I'm just going to get a clear sense of what my core entities are. And then as I move into the high level design, and you'll see this when we get there, we'll be more explicit about exactly the fields that matter. But for now, I would stop here. And with the, with the core APIs defined, I would move on to API. And so these are strictly speaking the user facing APIs. These are the APIs that the client is going to be making in order to satisfy the functional requirements. And so the way that you do this when you get here is that you should look back at your functional requirements and create an API, or in some cases more than one API, in order to satisfy each of these requirements. And they should exchange, return, take as input, the entities or um, you know, properties, fields of these entities. So let's run through an example of that. Book tickets. Um, let's do that one last, maybe because it's the most involved. Let's start with the simplest, view an event. So in order to view an event, I'm gonna have a git call. I'm gonna use a REST API. That's what you'll typically do in these interviews uh, in most cases, though you should consider other options, GraphQL being, being the main other one. So I'm gonna have git, event, and then I'm gonna have this path param of event ID. And so users can pass in an event ID and what they'll get in exchange is an event object They'll need to get information about that venue. They'll need to get information about that performer. This is everything needed for us to render a page about this event. And then we'll also need a list of tickets. This is going to be so that we can render the seat map. So like what tickets are available, where's their seat, etc. So take in an event ID and return these entities. That's going to be for viewing an event. Very easy. Um, now we can look back up here and we can go next for searching for an event. So if you want to search for an event, you would do git, maybe we'll have a search endpoint. Um, and this search endpoint can take in things like maybe a search term. This can be free text. Um, so something like this. And it would also probably take in a location. And so maybe this location is lat launch. I'm just going to have it abstracted as location for now. Maybe we have a type or a category. So this is something like, uh, is it a sporting event, music, etc. Uh, dot dot dot. Maybe there's some other query params that, that you would care about. Uh, date is probably a really important one too, right here, like date ranges. Um, these are all the optional fields that you can search for. And what this is going to return is that this is going to return, I'm going to use, this is just pseudo code here, um, derived uh, or inspired by TypeScript, but partial event a list of partial events. And the reason that I say partial here, and this isn't particularly interesting for the interview, you can denote this however you want, um, but just so it's clear, this is because I'm gonna return just a limited amount of information from that event, like the name, the description, the performer, whatever it may be, because I just need enough to show those search results. And then you'll click on those search results and, and, and hit this API endpoint to get the full detail. Um, but here's our, our search endpoint. So we have a basic, um, endpoint to satisfy viewing events, a basic endpoint to view searching for events. And the last thing that we need to do is satisfy booking a ticket. So this one's more interesting. And the reason that I paused before coming back into this one is because uh, you will notice, or it's important to notice that booking is actually a two phase process. So if you ever used a ticket master, or if you've ever bought an airline ticket, you would know that what you usually do is you see a seat map or you see a, an airplane map, you choose a seat, and then you go to a second phase where you're actually going to purchase that ticket. And so in that second phase, you usually have a timer or a countdown, maybe 10 minutes. 
in order to uh, actually purchase that ticket. And for that 10 minutes, that ticket's reserved for you. So you click on a ticket, it ends up being reserved. You then have 10 minutes to actually book it. If you don't book it, that ticket goes back to available. And that's the same pattern that we'll have here. So in an interview, some candidates, because they have experience with these sorts of things, they've thought about that, they know that, they know that it's two-phase and that's usually awesome to see, but it's not a requirement. If I see that, that a user writes a single endpoint for booking a ticket, then I'll point out, actually, this is gonna be a two-phase process and then they'll, they'll amend it accordingly. So what we'll end up doing here is, is we'll have some posts um, and we'll maybe call it booking. Um, and the first endpoint is going to be just to reserve. And this is going to take in in the body, just a ticket ID. And so there's variations of this problem where maybe you can reserve multiple tickets, you can click on multiple seats. We're gonna make it simple and just say there's a single seat that you click on that seats associated with a ticket and you're gonna get that ticket ID as the input and you're gonna to wanna to reserve it. You'll notice that I don't have user ID actually in the body here, this is on purpose. Uh, some candidates will put user ID here on it. It's, it's a security concern. You wouldn't paste or post uh, a user ID in the, in the request body because that could be altered. I could come in here and then post uh, a reservation on behalf of somebody else so long as I knew that user ID. So instead, usually user information is kept in the header, either by a JWT or a session token. Uh, and that's usually nice to note in your interview, kind of shows some technical excellence, but you don't need to spend too much time here. Then the, the second thing that you're going to do, that's gonna be your reservation. This is gonna reserve a ticket for 10 minutes and the user client is gonna to go to a payment page. And you're then gonna to try to fill out that payment. And so now we'll have another endpoint to confirm. Again, our header is gonna have that JWT. We're gonna need the ticket ID to say which one we're confirming. And then we'll have some payment details probably. And so we'll offload this to Stripe, third-party payment services. Stripe has things called payment intents, um, which use common client libraries that you can set up either in React or, or raw JavaScript, whatever it may be. Um, in order to get this payment information, and this will be posted back then to your server. So we have our two endpoints, just to recap, for booking a ticket, the first to reserve, and the second to confirm. And so maybe this isn't a post because we're not creating a new entry here. Uh, maybe this is just a put or a patch respectively, um, but, but certainly not the most important thing. Awesome, so that satisfies our core entities and our core APIs. And then in the next section, we're going to use these APIs in order to build up our high-level design. All right, so at this point, you should be about 15 minutes into the interview, um, which leaves you about 20 minutes to do your high-level design and your deep dives, um, give or take. Depending on your level, uh, maybe it's taking you a little bit longer to get here, and that would be totally fine as well. But the next step, we've done our requirements, core entities, and APIs. Let's, let's get into that high-level design. So again, the high-level design's goal is to uh, create a simple design that satisfies our three functional requirements. So in order to do that, let's zoom out a little bit. The first thing our design is going to have is the client. It's gonna be the user that's interfacing with our service. And then we're gonna opt for a microservices architecture. This is by far the most common setup in these types of interviews. If you're not sure which to go with, which architecture to go with, microservices is probably the right call. Um, so for that reason, we're going to have an API gateway. The API gateway's main responsibility is to take incoming API requests and route them to the correct server, uh, the correct microservice. Uh, it also does some other things. Uh, we can note those. It does authentication. Uh, it often does rate limiting. Uh, and then, of course, as we just mentioned, routing is that, that most important one. So when we build up our high-level design, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go one by one through our API requests. And of course our API requests map tap back to our functional requirements. So we can start with this one, viewing an event. What happens when the client, the user, ends up has a, having a Git request to an event ID in order to view an event? Well, let's draw that out. So what would happen is first, they're going to hit our API gateway. Our API gateway is going to route them to the correct microservice. In this case, I'm gonna call it the, what am I doing? Uh, I'm going to call this the event crud service. Uh, so while it's responsible for creating, reading, updating, and deleting events, um, you know most of those other crud operations are out of scope for this problem. We're just handling that view path, but that would be handled in this microservice. So that request is going to hit this service, and then the service is simply going to read off of our database. So we'll have a database here, 
And this database is going to store those core entities that we talked about. So we're going to have an event table. Let me zoom in. Uh, we're going to have an event table. And that event table is going to uh, have an ID. It's going to have a foreign key to a venue ID. It needs to be held somewhere. There's going to be some performer or team. Uh, obviously, it'll have a name, description, dot, 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 a bunch of different metadata. Uh, and then additionally, maybe importantly, it's also going to have a one-to-many relationship with all the tickets. Um, so this isn't going to actually be the ticket information. This is just going to be uh, foreign keys to all of the different tickets. Cool. So that's our event table. Um, they're less important, so we won't spend as much time on them, but we mentioned them. So we'll have a venue, which will have an ID. It'll have some location. It's probably going to have a seat map, some stuff like that. Um, oops. And then we'll also have a performer. It'll have an ID, dot, dot, dot. Who cares? You know the details there. Cool. And then while we'll, we'll probably come back to it, um, you know, we'll also have our ticket table and that ticket table will be an ID per ticket, uh, probably a seat, price, et cetera, right? So seat here is like the location. Uh, and then of course, it's gonna have a relation back to an event. So this is everything that's stored in, in this database. Um, we can opt for, you know, here's where that SQL, no SQL conversation comes in. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about why that's probably not relevant, but at least for this database, we talked about consistency being important for tickets in particular. There's obviously some decent relationships between this data. We've shown that now, one-to-one, -one, one to many So these are the properties that matter to us. I'm gonna go with Postgres, a SQL database, under the justification that one, it's, it's one that I use frequently. Um, and it certainly satisfies our requirements here for ACID properties on tickets, uh, allows for the ability to do transactions, and you know it's it's good for these SQL queries where we'll have to have some mild relationships, but it's worth knowing that like a NoSQL database would have been fine here too. You could have chose DynamoDB, and actually, in your interview, NoSQL versus SQL is kind of an old debate. Like it, it's it's not that interesting. Um, what's more interesting is the qualities of the database that you need, because the reality is most of the things that a SQL database can do, a NoSQL database can do nowadays, and most of the days that a, things that a SQL database can do, a NoSQL database can do. So. You can have ACID properties on DynamoDB, for example, um, totally fine. Actually, in the interview, it's sometimes, not even sometimes, it shows the candidate's seniority when they understand that that's kind of not a relevant debate. Like many mid-level candidates will go SQL versus no SQL and sort of try to break all of this down. Whereas the more senior candidates just say, here are the qualities of the database that I need. Either of these would have worked in this case. I'm gonna go with Postgres because it's the one that I'm, uh, I'm most familiar with and it'll do just fine for the job. Cool, great, and we move on. Um, so this is this is that appropriate time to map out the fields uh, and the columns. I mentioned that we would come back to this. At this point, I put them right next to my database because typically they evolve. And you'll see this, they'll evolve in this design too. But this is what we know for now. So coming back to that GET request, a user is going to want to view an event. So they're going to hit our event CRUD service. We'll get the event details, the, the venue and the performer from a join, uh, as well as you know the tickets that are available and we'll return that back to the client. So very simple, that satisfies our first API endpoint here. The second one is our search endpoint. Um, our search endpoint for that, let's do this. I'm gonna move these down a little bit maybe. Okay, and then I'm gonna add a search service. So I'm gonna add a search service and for now, in our high-level design, I'm gonna do this as simple as humanly possible. And that means that I'm just going to do this. So a user is going to search for something. Let's maybe copy this so that it's close and, and clear. They're going to search for something. And at least based on term, type, date, etc., this can just be a SQL query. So it can be something like select star from our DB where type in whatever and uh, term or, you know, name, like, uh, whatever our term is. You kind of get the picture here. Um, this would work. Now, for what it's worth, this totally sucks and it's incredibly slow. And the reason it's incredibly slow is these wild cards here mean that we need to scan this entire database. We need to be, do an entire DB scan to see if any of the names match whatever term was inputted here. Um, that's not going to cut it, but 
For now, in my high level design, I'm gonna leave it like this and I'm gonna come back to this. And I might even say that in the interview, I'm gonna say, this isn't gonna cut it. Uh, I'm gonna come back and optimize this once I've satisfied all of my functional requirements first. So that's our very simple search case. Um, the last thing that we need to do is we need to satisfy booking. So again, two-step booking flow, reserve a ticket and then confirm the purchase of that. So in order to do this, I am going to add a new service, which is going to be my booking service. And so that first request is going to come in. This is going to be that kind of reserve request. That reserve request comes in. And what do we do? The first thing that we do is we update our database. This is going to be a single direction. We update our database here. Um, such that for this ticket ID, remember this reserve came with a ticket ID. So for this ticket ID, we'll look up that row in our table and then we'll update a status column. So we'll add a new column for status. And this is gonna be either available, reserved, or booked. And so we'll update it in this case to reserved. And then our user will return to the client saying success, 200. And then the next request that's gonna come in is that purchase request or that confirm request. It's also going to take in a ticket ID as well as those payment details, right? So that guy's going to come in now. We're going to use Stripe, a third party payment processor. Um, in almost all of these cases, you can abstract out away the payment unless it's an interview that's like specifically for a payment team or has specifics to do with you needing to design a payment system. But we're just going to use Stripe. Because it's interesting, the, the way that this works is that you actually call out to Stripe with the payment information. You're gonna to post to Stripe and then Stripe is gonna handle that payment asynchronously. It needs to call out to the credit card companies, determine whether or not it can be paid for. It happens very quickly for what it's worth, but it handles that asynchronously. And then it calls back to your system, not by responding to this single request, but actually via a, a webhook that you've set up. So you're gonna register a callback URL and you'll have some endpoints in your booking service. Uh, wrong way around. Um, you'll have some endpoint in your booking service, which is exposed for this to call back to. So just good to know, but, but not necessary maybe for the interview. The point is we'll get the payment information. We'll call out to Stripe. Stripe will handle that, reach out to the, the credit card companies, et cetera, the banks, and then respond with what happened. And it's gonna respond if that response is that it was successfully able to pay, then great. What we're gonna do then is we're gonna reach back out to our database, go to the ticket table and update this status now to booked. Amazing. And it would probably not only be booked, but we'll also have like a user ID here who actually booked it. And now this ticket is no longer available. It's assigned to that user. Maybe we'd send them an email, all of this. I'm gonna consider that out of scope, but that's what's gonna happen in the happy path here. So this is, sort of our high level design, but astute listeners, watchers would have realized that there's something wrong with this two phase booking process right now. And specifically what's wrong is that if a user were to click on a seat and then go to the payment page and on the payment page, they have that 10 minute countdown. What happens if that 10 minutes is exceeded? What happens if they just close their laptop and we're done? They decided they didn't actually want this ticket. Well, in our case, what would happen is that this status would stay reserved forever. And what that means is that when we show users the seat map, we'd be querying our database for tickets that are available, which would exclude the reserved, of course. And that seat would basically just be infinitely reserved for that user, which is wrong. And that doesn't meet our requirements of it needing to expire after 10 minutes. So how could we handle that? The first thing that we could do is that we can add an additional column here with the timestamp with the timestamp of when, oh my gosh, with the timestamp of when this thing was reserved. So reserved timestamp. And now what we can do is that when we read the database to see what's available, this query would look like select all tickets where the status is available and, or excuse me, or it's reserved, but the reserved timestamp is more than 10 minutes ago. So we made this query a little bit more complicated, but this would absolutely work. Um, now this is an okay option. The, the one downside of this option is that you, you make your database and your data model here a bit confusing. You have a status of reserve while things aren't actually in a reserve status and you need to keep these two things consistent with one another. That sort of sucks. 
So there's something else that we can do. And we can introduce, for example, a cron job here. And this cron job might run every 10 minutes or so. And it's responsible for querying the database for every ticket, querying the database for every ticket that's in a reserve status, uh, and then checking its reserve timestamp. And if it's been more than 10 minutes since the reserve timestamp, then it's going to set the status back to available. So that's what this cron job would do. Now this works and is totally a valid approach. And in fact, for mid-level candidates, uh, this, is, this is kind of a passing approach for the interview. Now for senior and, and certainly staff, principal and beyond, this wouldn't quite be enough. And the reason it wouldn't be enough is because there's a delta that gets introduced here. We'll call it N. Between the time when a ticket should have been um, unreserved and the time when our cron job ran. So if our cron job ran every 10 minutes or so, and we had a ticket that was supposed to be unreserved at noon, but our cron job didn't run again until 12.09, then N equals nine. We had nine minutes where this thing was should have been available, but instead it was reserved. And ultimately the ticket was reserved for 19 minutes, not just 10, as was expected. So we need something that's a bit more real time. And to do this, we can do something a bit more sophisticated. We can get rid of the cron job, and we can actually get rid of the reserve timestamp as well, as well as this reserve status. And instead we're gonna introduce a distributed lock. So we'll call this our ticket lock. And we can use Redis, uh, you can use kind of any in-memory in cache here. But what this is going to be used for is that when a ticket gets reserved, instead of updating our ticket table at all, we're just gonna keep track of that here. And we're gonna keep track of it with a TTL. So we'll have some key value pair of ticket ID to maybe just a Boolean of true, that part doesn't, doesn't matter. And then a TTL of 10 minutes. And so that means that after 10 minutes, this key value pair is immediately going to be deleted from our database. So how would this work? When a user tries to reserve a ticket from that first API request, we're not gonna write to the database at all. Instead, we're simply going to put that ticket in our lock. We're gonna lock that ticket for 10 minutes by setting the ticket ID with a TTL of 10 minutes. Awesome. Now, if 10 minutes elapses, or actually maybe, let me, let me not get my head of myself. By doing that, we know now things are locked. And so in our event CRUD service, when we want to for a given event, get all of the tickets for that event and see whether or not they're available. We would need to first query our database for all tickets that have a status of available. And then for each of those ticket IDs, we would need to look them up in Redis to see if they're reserved. If they are, we would remove them from that list of available tickets and send it back to our client. Great. Now, in the case of that user who closed their laptop, you know, before they were able to confirm their payment, this is gonna expire immediately at 10 minutes. So if a user at 10 minutes and one second, 10 seconds, whatever it wants to, is gonna be, queries to get our seat map again and to get the available tickets, now when we cross-reference it with the ticket lock, that ticket ID is no longer gonna be there. And as a result, that ticket is going to be available and it's going to be shown to the client for them to be able to book it. Easy. So this is a super easy, elegant solution um, to use a distributed lock here and the reason that we use a distributed lock as opposed to maybe just keeping this in memory in the booking service is because there's going to be multiple instances of this booking service, right? This isn't a single machine. This isn't a single compute resource. Um, this is going to horizontally scale and they all need to have a, the same consistent singular view of the lock. And so that's why we separate this out and have it as a uh, kind of as its own um, in memory cache here. Hopefully that makes sense. This is sort of the optimal, the optimal answer. Um, I'll mention just quickly, sometimes candidates will ask or want to go into or an interviewer may ask like, what happens if this lock goes down? Well, if this lock goes down, then you would have the following issue. One, we'd immediately bring a new one up. We would detect that this is down and we would immediately bring a new one up. But that means that any users that reserved a ticket in that last 10 minutes lost their reservation. And so in theory, for a 10 minute window, we could have several users go to a payment page and try to book the same ticket. Now, because this is a, um, a Postgres DB here, and we still have the, the ACID properties on the write to available or booked, meaning one write needs to complete before another one could read it, um, whoever ends up submitting that purchase first is going to win. Um, and the other one's gonna get an error. And this is a, a bad user experience. It sucks for those users in that 10 minute window, they're gonna have a bad user experience. And this is a conversation that we would have with the product team. Like, is this okay? 
is it okay that in the likely event we have a, a, a disaster where our lock goes down, then we'll have a small 10 minute period where we're not gonna lose our consistency guarantees, but our users are gonna have a bad experience. And I would probably argue that, that this is fine for what it's worth. Okay. Um, so this is now our high level design. This satisfies all of our functional requirements. It's not perfect. It doesn't scale. Searches is, is not great, but we'll handle all of that next in our deep dives. Okay, now for the fun part. So with the deep dives, this is where senior and staff and particular candidates really earn their keep. If you're a mid-level candidate, what you have right here on the board already might be passing, especially if you got that Redis lock. Uh, most mid-level candidates don't get that far. Most mid-level candidates land on the um, on the cron job solution that we discussed. But you're close here if you're a mid-level candidate. Your interviewer might ask you a little bit more about how you would scale the system. They might ask about search being slow, etc. Answer those questions well, and you probably have this in the back. Um, in any case, especially for senior and staff candidates, this is the place where you're going to show off your chops. We're going to show off that you can go deep. And your goal should be to find one to three places where you can show off that depth. I'm going to go into detail on a couple of such places, but by no means are these the only places. They're not the ones an interviewer is explicitly looking for. It's really up to you to decide where you lead the conversation from here. Now, the process that you should take when you hit the non-functional, or excuse me, when you hit the, the deep dives is to reference your non-functional requirements and look at them and see what's missing. And that should really inform where you go next with your deep dive. So we talked a lot about how search wasn't optimized. And that's the first place that I want to start. And actually, you'll notice that well, I went back and added it here already. Um, but we originally didn't have low latency search. And this was a miss. So this was something that I missed originally in the non-functional requirements. I realized it as I was designing the system. And it's totally okay to go back and edit it. That's something that you can do and should do in the interview. That's great. So it's the first one that we're going to handle here low latency search. So we come back and our current solution we know is slow. The current solution is slow because we do a full table scan on a query like this. So this is our API endpoint for search. I'm just going to move it out of the way. I'm going to delete that. And the common solution to search problems like this is to introduce a search optimized database. And a very popular one and one that I recommend you use in your interviews is called Elasticsearch. And so the way that Elasticsearch works is, along with other things, it builds an inverted index to make searching documents by terms really quickly. So you can imagine that we have an event. An event has some text for the name and the description and maybe all of these other things that describe the event. And what we're going to do is we're going to tokenize that string or those sets of strings and create terms from them. So you could imagine that the string might be the Philadelphia Eagles are playing in a wild card matchup against the Broncos, this, that, and the other. I guess that couldn't happen, NFC versus AFC, but uh, you get my point. We would turn that into uh, Philadelphia, Eagles, playoff, wild card, all of those terms. And then we can map those in a hash map of sorts to the documents, or in our case, the events that those show up in. So the word playoff shows up in event one, event two, and event three. And then maybe the word Swift, like Taylor Swift, shows up in event five, event six, six, and event N. You get the point. And so now you have this really quick lookup such that if somebody searches in description for playoff, then we can easily return to them all the events that mention playoffs and show them the relevant events based on their search term. And this can be combined not just on description, not just on name. We would probably search term on each of those. Elasticsearch also has support for geospatial queries. It actually uses a combination of quad trees and geohashing, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on that, um, but I'm pretty sure. And so you can do these sorts of things like searching for location and terms and dates at the same time. And it'll use the, the varying indexes that it's created, whether these inverted indexes or geospatial indexes, to make it as quick as possible. So Elasticsearch is a really effective solution to make these search queries as quick as possible. So we can delete this line and instead we'll search using Elasticsearch. And so then the question becomes, how do we get data into Elasticsearch? And how do we make sure that that data is consistent with what's in our primary database? And so it's important to note that it's not best practice to use Elasticsearch as your primary data store. 
And this is usually on the back of durability concerns and it has no support for like complex transaction management. Um, actually, we used Elasticsearch um, as a primary data store for, for our first startup and we learned the hard way that it didn't work out very well. So I know this from firsthand experience. Um, so as a result of that, we need some way to make sure that if anything changes in our primary database, that change gets propagated to Elasticsearch. And so there's a couple of ways that we can do that. The simplest way is that we just handle this all in our application code. So in this case, anytime an event is added, anytime an event is added, we'll write it to our Postgres DB and we'll also write it to Elasticsearch. Now this puts some complex logic, kind of complex logic in your application code here, because you'll need to make sure what happens if this write fails, then you don't want this write to happen. What happens if this write fails, then you probably need to retry this write, write or back out, um, reverse that first write. So there's some things to consider there depending on your product requirements, but that's definitely a viable solution. Another common solution that you'll see pop up a lot is using what's called change data capture. So change data capture or CDC as it's often referred to is a process for which changes to a primary data store uh, can be put onto a stream and then those change events can be consumed and something can be done with them. So in this case, anytime something changes, that change event will be put on a stream, we can consume it and then update Elasticsearch with whatever that change was. So in interviews, this is oftentimes just abstracted to be this, uh, you know, you can just do that. Technically speaking, like this is a large abstraction, you know, this is a stream, there would have to be some worker that, that does the right here. Um, but oftentimes this is good enough in the interview. You might want to clarify that this is an abstraction, but that would work well. The one thing to be aware of with CDC and particularly with rights to Elasticsearch is that it has a limit on the number of writes that it could take per second because it's updating these indexes, right, in each write. So for services that your systems that you're gonna be designing for which there are a lot of updates to Elasticsearch, then you'll need to do something smarter here, like have a queue, have some batching, whatever. But in our case, you would note in the interview that events, venues, performers, like these don't change a lot. They hardly ever change. And not only do they not change a lot, but they're hardly ever added. Maybe at most an admin adds tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands a day, but that's absolutely nothing. Um, so we don't necessarily need the queue there. We can just update Elasticsearch on each change to our primary database. So in doing that, our search is pretty dang quick. This is great. The introduction of Elasticsearch was perfect. I'll spend just a moment going into how we can make this maybe even faster. Your interviewer might ask you, what about popular queries? What about if everybody is searching for Taylor Swift? How can we make that as quick as possible? Um, so the answer to that is usually caching. Now you need to recognize that in our system, we're not doing any ranking or recommendations for users. So if two users search for the same thing, they're gonna get the same result and that's important. And that's very important to note for caching, of course. Um, and so there's a couple ways that we can handle this. The first is that for Elasticsearch here, you might be using, and you probably are using OpenSearch, AWS is OpenSearch. This is like a fully managed Elasticsearch cluster. And OpenSearch supports something called node query caching. I believe that's what it's called. Again, maybe don't quote me, look that up, but I, I think that's what it's called. And what this is, is that this is a cache on each of the instances of your Elasticsearch cluster, each of your shards, um, and it caches the top 10K queries to that shard in a least recently used cache. So you can enable that, I think just via the config, and that's a great option, quick, dirty, easy, and that's gonna work great. So that's kind of option one. Another thing that you can do, of course, is that you could add Redis or memcache here, and you could cache your search term or some normalization of your search search term, as well as the search results, and then that would work fine as well. Then you just need to make sure that you invalidate appropriately when there are updates made, things like that. So that's an option. Another option, and the option that I would probably take here just because it's, it's quick and easy, is that your system probably already has a CDN, uh, for the static images, which was out of scope for us, but you know most systems will have it. And so we can have a CDN here. And what the CDN is gonna do is that the CDN can cache these API calls. 
So we can cache this API call and its results. And usually when you cache an API endpoint in a CDN, it's for a short period of time, 30 seconds to a minute or so. But that way, if a lot of people are searching for the same exact search term, then you can just return those results immediately by hitting that CDN, which is, of course, geographically located close to them. So this is wicked fast. Um, a couple downsides to note here. Pros, it's super fast. It's great for those super popular events in particular. Um, but this becomes less useful the more permutations you have of your search query. It's like we already have a lot of things here. Type, date, location. If this was lat launch, then this would kind of take this out of the picture because it would be a user's lat launch that would have too much precision. Um, and thus we would never have any overlap. Two users would never hit the same. But if this was something like San Francisco, okay, and then term. And so like maybe that would be small enough that you would have enough cache hits. But the more query terms that you have here, the more query params, the less likely you're gonna get cache hits and the more likely that you're just wasting space in the CDN. So that's definitely something to consider. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, if the system evolved such that it gave personalized recommendations, then this wouldn't suffice because this would mean that everybody who searched the same, um, uh, you know, searched with the same uh, API call here, they would get the same results. And that wouldn't be true for our system anymore because people should get personalized results. So these are all the sorts of things that you can mention in the interview. Um, and it's impressive just to throw some of these things out there if they're contextually relevant. Okay, so we talked a lot about search there. That's the search deep dive. Looking back at our non-functional requirements, low latency search, check, we met that. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually gonna go out of order here just because I wanna focus on maybe some of the most fun and interesting ones. And I'm going to go to scalability to handle surges from popular events. So let's take a moment to lead the conversation then in that direction. So the first thing that you'll notice is taking a step back and focusing on the user experience. When a user comes to our website and they click on an event, they're going to see those event details about the event venue performer, and they're going to see a seat map. And the seat map is going to show them seats that are available and seats that are already booked, and they can click on those that are available. And so the way that this would work in our system right now is that they would query our event CRUD service. We would query to get our event venue and performer. And then we would query to get the tickets for that event with their available or book status. And then we would need to cross-reference that available or book status with tickets that might be in our lock. So anything that's in our lock needs to be moved from available to reserved or just booked so that uh, the client knows that it can't book it. So we would do all of that and give it back to the client. Now, the issue with this is that we made that API, API call, we loaded that up on the client, and now immediately the client sees an accurate representation. But after one second, two seconds, five seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, it's grown stale. And now they can be clicking on seats that appear to be available, but they're no longer available. And we're gonna have to immediately give the user an error. And that's a really bad experience. So particularly for these more popular events, that would happen a lot. Like a lot of people are buying tickets, so it could go stale really quickly. So the first thing that we could do here is we could try to make that map real time. And this means that anytime a ticket becomes reserved or moved to book, then we update the client to mark that seat in real time as no longer available. And we could do that a couple of ways. The first thing that we could do and would probably be the most simple is we could just use long polling. Um, so long polling is the client opens up uh, or sends in an, an HTTP request and then that request is kept open for usually like 30 seconds to a minute or so for the server to be able to respond. Um, and this can happen in a while loop. So you kind of just keep long pulling, keep long pulling. So the server can keep sending things back and keep sending things back. And in our case, keep the seats updated. So that's one option. It would be super cheap. It's easy to implement, requires no additional infrastructure, um, especially if users are not on this page for a long time. This is great. If users are on this page for a minute to five minutes, this is perfect. If we find from our analytics that users sit on these pages for a really long time, five, 10, 20, 30 minutes, hours, then we may need a slightly more sophisticated approach. And that sophisticated approach could be to open up a, a persistent connection. And so your mind might have gone to WebSockets, and that would be an option. A WebSocket is a bi directional persistent connection. Um, but instead, we could probably. In go for server sent events or SSE. And so while not similar, maybe in implementation, they're similar in that they are a 
persistent connection between the client and the server, such that the server can send information to the client, um, not only when the client sends a response. So in the beginning, open up that connection, and then the client or the server can push information over that SSE connection kind of whenever it wants, so long as the connection is still open. And the difference, the key difference, uh, aside from their implementation between WebSockets and SSE, is that WebSockets are fully bidirectional, SSE is unidirectional, so it's only server to client. And that's all that we need here, right? We only need our server to be able to tell our client that new seats have been taken. So that's something that, that you could do, and you could talk about this in the interview. Um, I'm going to set up SSE connections, persistent connections between my API gateway, my event crud service, and my client. And every single time there's a change to either of these on the status of available or booked or on my reserved, I'm going to push that change over to my client. And the implementation there is actually a bit more complex. It's probably out of scope for this interview, but that's kind of the degree that you would probably go into. Um, and that'll be fine. And then your interviewer might point out, or maybe you would notice proactively that this is great, but when Taylor Swift, the Super Bowl, the World Cup comes around, the user experience is going to be that they get to that page and it immediately goes black. They'll see all these available seats and then within you know, a couple of milliseconds, it's just gonna go black because everything got booked because you had 100,000 or a million people all trying to fight for the same 10,000 to 100,000 seats. And so that's not great. So what can we do to fix that issue now. The solution there is that we need to introduce a choke point. We basically need to protect our backend services, introduce a choke point, improve the user experience by doing so. And that choke point would be by way of what's referred to as a virtual waiting queue. So what you would end up with is, let's see if I can make room for this. You can move all of this over and introduce here a virtual waiting queue. And so this virtual waiting queue could be only enabled for really popular events. Maybe it's admin enabled. There's some config here and an admin determines what events we should introduce a virtual waiting queue for. But at a high level in abstraction, what happens is that you have a million people or so that all try to buy the Taylor Swift tickets. And instead of seeing that event detail page, they enter a waiting queue and they get a message that says, thanks for your interest. You're in the queue. We'll let you know when you're out. Um, and they get put in this queue. And this queue could just be Redis here. Um, that would probably be a cheap, lightweight implementation. You can use a Redis sorted set so that it's a priority queue based on the time that they arrived. Other implementations make this random, so it's a bit more fair, and it's not just the users who are closest to our, our company servers that maybe get in first. But in any case, you'll have that set, and then you'll probably have some event-driven logic such that you know once we have 100 seats booked, we let the first 100 people in, once we have 100 seats that are booked, we let the next 100 or 1,000, whatever it may be, and you pull those people off of the queue, maybe you put their user ID or their session or you assigned them a token, and you pull that off this virtual waiting queue. And then you can notify the users, maybe over that same SSE connection that you created um, prior, that they're ready to go, and then that user can be let in, and that user can book. So this is actually a really nice example where this is a simple solution. It's a simple solution, but it's a sophisticated solution. And it shows that oftentimes like the best answer isn't the most technically complex, um, but instead it solves the problem in a simple and maybe creative way. So the virtual waiting queue there is great. Um, okay, those are, those are some great deep dives. We can come back and look. Strong consistency for booking tickets. We actually already covered that in our functional requirements when we were dealing with booking. We introduced our Redis lock. So we, we got to that one early. We covered that. We have strong consistency. That's wonderful. High availability for searching and viewing, as well as our read uh, to write ratio being in the favor of reads significantly. So this is where you might just get the normal questions of like, how would you scale the system? Or maybe you proactively talk about it. As an interviewer, I usually find these discussions kind of the least interesting, and that's because here's what you're going to say. You're going to say something like, I use AWS API Gateway here, which is managed. It has its own load balancers, so this is scaling. Um, each of these have their own load balancers and dynamically scale based on memory consumption or CPU consumption, so these scale horizontally. That's great. Um, for my databases here, maybe you talk about sharding. This would be an appropriate time, actually, to even do some math. Um, actually, quick aside on math, uh, uh, astute watchers might have realized that I didn't do any back of the envelope estimations after my non-functional requirements. Um, 
this is on purpose. I actually recommend this. So most candidates will do some back of the envelope estimations there, and it'll be things like um, QPS and daily active users and storage. And at the end of it, they'll go, wow, okay, it's a lot. So it's going to be a big system. And then they'll keep going. I didn't learn anything about the candidate. The candidate didn't learn anything that would inform their design. They were just checking a box. So I considered this useless. I considered this math without a purpose. So math is good. But my recommendation is that you only do calculations if the result of the calculations will have a direct influence on your design. And usually the right time to do that is either in your high level design or in your deep dives. So for example, maybe I do some math here now and I won't because I don't want this video to go a little uh, too long, but I could do some math to see what the storage is here in this PostgreSQL to make a determination as to whether we need to shard or not, or it could fit into uh, you know, a single Postgres instance. And so if I came to the conclusion that we did need to shard, then I would have a conversation about what I need to shard on. And maybe that's event ID, because that's what the majority of my queries are in. Or if we're sharding and then distributing these shards geographically, maybe I do it over venue ID. If there's high correlation between people searching for events that are in venues close to them, then maybe that makes sense too. So you would weigh that. Um, again, no wrong, no right answer. It's a discussion maybe to have with the interviewer, weigh the pros and cons, but that's something that you could talk about there too. So that's the general scaling conversation. And then given that reads are so much higher than writes, another thing that we could do is to reduce the read load on our Postgres DB here. And especially because event venue and performer never change or very infrequently change, it makes them a great candidate to just cache them to hell. So we could have Redis here and we can cache those events, venues, and performers in Redis, make sure that if we make any updates to our database, then we'll have to invalidate or update our cache as well. There doesn't need to be an eviction policy like least frequently used or least recently used or anything because we'll probably fit them all in there. Um, or maybe we just do events that are you know, upcoming or within the last four months and in the next two years, whatever it may be, you, you introduce some bounds there. But now this makes this view API call, this one, wicked fast because we can just cache a key value pair of an event ID to the event venue and performer relevant to it. And then we only need to make a query to get tickets because that's the one that's dynamic. So we'll, we'll not cache that one in this case. Awesome. Um, okay. So that's a little taste of some of the deep dives that you could do. I think what we end up here is a pretty solid design. If you did this, you certainly pass a mid-level interview. Uh, with flying, flying, flying colors. This is overkill for a mid-level interview by far. You definitely pass a senior interview, that's great. You probably pass a staff interview, um, depending on how well you executed, how well you were able to answer some questions, and if you showed some depth in other places. Um, and, you know, principles usually evaluated at the same level of staff, so you pass that as well. Um, okay. Last thing here is that when you conclude, you should be able to look at your design concretely and you should be able to say, does this satisfy all of my functional requirements and does it satisfy all of my non-functional requirements? If you can say yes to both of those things, then you should feel confident. You should put your hands up. You should say, I know I passed this interview. I can't wait to get the call back. Obviously, don't say that. Um, and you're probably hired. So that's the, the process that you should follow. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. I really hope you found this valuable. Uh, if you did, let me know in the comments. I want to do more of these and uh, if people are finding value out of them, then that'll encourage me to keep pumping them out. Um, also, if there's anything that I did wrong, uh, if you think was silly, was a bad design decision, or if you just have general questions, please leave those in the comments. I'd love to chat about it. Um, but thanks so much for watching and good luck with your upcoming interviews. Take care.